Hey, Steve Mignone here doing the junkyard crawl at Bernarston Auto Wrecking in Bernarston, Massachusetts. All right, that's it. Katie, you are a mean scene stealer. You know what I have that you don't have? An opposable thumb. That's right. You know what you need to do? Go to Hollywood, go that way, get to Lancashire Boulevard, and you're gonna find a guy named uh, Warner, okay? Ask for the Warner Brothers. They'll get an interview and just go. Anyway, 1978. Plymouth Volare station wagon right here. The Volare, as we know, was Chrysler, Plymouth's, and Dodge's response to the OPEC oil crisis of 1973. The downsizing was, was mandated, and cars had to get smaller and more fuel efficient. And believe it or not, this was considered an, an intermediate or even a compact car. This replaced the Valiant and the Dart A bodies, and uh, these arrived in 1976. So by 1978, when this thing was built, a total of 217,755 Volares were built of which only 70,728 were wagons like this. But check this out. In 1978, the full-size sea bodies, the Newports, the New Yorkers, only 70,000 of those sold. So the mid-sized cars were the right car at the right time and really helped to save Chrysler, even though in 78, 79, Chrysler would start to go into bankruptcy, would need a bailout, which then resulted in the K cars, the 1980s. But anyway, this one here is a pretty well-loaded one, the Valaria with the wood paneling on the side, not metal, but it sure looks cool, a classic and American touch on these things, and uh, a few different engines possible on these things. So let's pop the hood and see which one we have. And of course, these are rear-wheel drive cars. Uh, one of Chrysler's last big budget developments of a rear-wheel drive platform before going almost all front-wheel drive with the L and the K cars of uh, 78 onward. But under the hood, well, here it is. This is the Slant 6, which was the base engine uh, in the Volare and the Aspen, which was the cousin. But this one's something special. It says here on the air cleaner, Super 6. What does that mean? Well, the Super 6 tells us there's a two-barrel carburetor under the air cleaner. That is the BBD 280 CFM two-barrel Carter carburetor. Same carburetor used in the 318 and the 273 in earlier years. So 270, or two, yeah, 240 CFM. And what that results in is uh, 110 horsepower and 180 foot-pounds of torque, which is 10 horse and 10 foot-pounds more than the one barrel that would have been standard fare. Now, the beauty is the Super 6 was standard in wagons, but optional on sedans and hardtops. But I used to live in California, and one thing we'd always do in the junkyard, try to find Valari and Aspen wagons from 77, 8, 9, 80, that the years these were built, with the Super 6, grab that Super 6 off, put it on your one barrel, Dodge, Dart, whatever, you'd feel the difference. It was absolutely uh, a worthy change, easily done, too. Now, one thing we see here is, you know, the old days of Ram Air hoods, air grabbers, and coyote dusters. Well, kind of, you know, these came standard with a little zip tube between the fender mounted air scoop and the air cleaner because cooler, denser air makes more power and allows better combustion, which is a fuel efficiency thing. Now, getting back to the Warner Brothers, uh, that was the Roadrunner owners, and in 1978, this is February of 78, Motor Trend Magazine, we know the drill. Cancelled? What do you mean we're cancelled? But in 1978, Motor Trend made another little boo-boo, not really, but sort of. This is the Volare Load Runner, a car that never happened. This is a pre-production prototype, and the idea was that Road Runner convertible, a wagon, load, road, get it, load runner. So some say they made these things, but this was a mule, and this is for sure. Now, if you look here, we'll see on the left, the Load Runner borrowed some Road Runner Sport Pack to alter the appearance. They had a front spoiler, front and rear wheel opening flares, dual body color mirrors, roof luggage rack, blacked out grill, rally custom wheels, and tape stripes inside bucket seats, uh, which are otherwise unavailable in a wagon. The tough wheel, the wood grain instrument panel, carpeted interior. The Load Runner offered in three colors, black, red, and white, $500 range. Now it says here, very important, it should be pointed out that the car shown in the accompanying pictures is the mule car used by Plymouth product planners to work out design details. These never made production. On the right, we see right here, the Load Runner was going to be produced by Jim Wanger's Motortown Corporation. Yes, Jim Wanger's that guy who helped make the GTO a reality. He also ran a thing called Motortown, which was a conversion shop that also did the Pontiac Can-Am, the Velari Super Coupe, and a lot of other phase two cars or tier two cars, including the Mustang Cobra II, yeah. So this is something that never happened. Even though they have a 360 here, that's kind of cool. You could get a 364 barrel on a wagon. Oh, yes, you could. But again, never with the Roadrunner. It did come out as the sport wagon in 1979 and 80. That was true. But again, the Loadrunner never did happen. Now, with that said, 
the license plate we have right here, this is a manufacturer plate from 1978, uh, initially issued in 76, but this right here, manufacturer plate, this is a similar to a plate that would have been run on a factory mule or a pre-production prototype. I got this thing, well, I can't tell you where, but anyway, manufacturer plates are cool because these are generally from the car makers and were used so they could put a plate on something that wasn't production normal or was maybe a prototype or just kind of weird and have factory insurance and registration to sort of cover it as an umbrella. So manufacturer plates are kind of cool. And yes, the load runner in that Motor Trend article had manufacturer plates on it because it was a mule. This is not a mule. This is just a regular run-of-the-mill Volare uh, wagon. But again, something cool about that Super 6, we'll take a look at the VIN. And like all Mopars, in the fifth spot we have an engine code. The two-barrel Slant 6, the Super 6, had its own code, D. So the single one-barrel 225 Slant would have a C. So sure enough, the D tells us it's a factory Super 6. Now inside, we won't see uh, bucket seats and a console, but this does have the sexier split bench, kind of like bucket seats, but again, right and left sides, the center console comes down, armrest, if you will, not a console. But the speedometer on this goes to 100 miles an hour, which was standard stuff on all Volares and Aspens from 70 through about 1979. They finally went to the 85 mile an hour joke speedometers. But again, no 120 speedos in Volaris or Aspens. Uh, and plenty of room in the back of these things. We can see right here, very luxurious. This might well be a, uh, a, a premier edition with the uh, carpeting on the back of those seats and the chrome strips and the leather-ish upholstery. Pretty upscale for a Volari. But again, it probably is the Volari premier. But this here is a 1977 Volari catalog, one year older than the car, but same stuff. And we'll take a peek inside here. We have, of course, the Premier Coupe. Premier was the uh, luxury edition or version with extra fuzz, extra plush here, there, and there, etc. And then, of course, yeah, the Roadrunner. They still made Roadrunners. And yes, you could get a Slant 6 in a Roadrunner, 1980. Horrible, but true. But by this point in time, the Roadrunners were still 318 or 360 powered. And this is the Super Pack right here. But don't look for a load runner ever from Plymouth. And here's the wagons right here. I love the look of a, the rally wheels right there, which first appeared in 1970, but those larger center caps you see right there are from 1972 onward, so a bit of a difference. But here we have it here, the, the buckets with the center armrest right there, or the utilitarian bench up front. So again, an interesting little look back. But yeah, if anybody tells you they had a load runner or a road runner wagon, they either had the mule, which was tested by Motor Trend and probably crushed, or maybe it lives on, or they had something called a sport wagon, which was similar but not the same. Now at the back of this, we can see lots of cool stuff. To save weight and cost, the typical descending window was deleted altogether, fixed window glass. But again, this tailgate would lift up like that for plenty of access to the back. Just don't bump your head. But again, without the, the split tailgate, you didn't have to worry about bending. You could just go right to the bumper, load your junk, which was convenient. This little thing right here is kind of a cool thing. It basically is an air deflector, a foil. An air stream would come down here and sort of turbulize or turbulent or whatever you want to call it and help to keep the window clean. But look right here, a little warning here. It says to avoid exhaust gas entry, keep lift gate closed and latched when engine is running as if you might go down the road with the tailgate up. I guess you could if you had a really long uh, bunch of uh, boards or two by fours or something like that. But otherwise you wouldn't be riding one of these things with the tailgate open if you were normal. But anyway, this one has the steel bumpers on the back and it does have compressors, shock absorbers inside. If we look here, you'll see the flexible area right here to conceal the fact that the bumper is spaced away from the body enough so we can actually crunch in like that and return. Yes, that's crush range right there. Uh, if this trim went here, it'd be crumbled. And there was a mandate, of course, back then to have a five mile, mile per hour impact at the nose. It would have to heal itself and at the back, two and a half miles per hour. So the, the uh, hydraulic bumper mounts on these things were standard all the way from 1976 through 1980 when the final year was out. Uh, the one thing we can see on this one is interesting, the leaf springs. Yes, these have leaf springs in the back and transverse torsion bars up front, but the leaf springs held helpers. You'll see a bolt-on leaf underneath the main leaf, and that's something that would have been done uh, a couple years down the road when the leaves started to sag on the back. And we can see right here, unleaded fuel only. That's correct. No more leaded fuel because the catalytic converters in these or the lean burn systems were very unhappy with leaded fuels, which was being phased out by Uncle Sam uh, at the point in time. But one of the problems with these things was rust. Uh, we can see right down here in the rockers, terminal, nasty structural rust really just taking root. And there were huge recalls. One area in particular on the 76 and 77 Volares and Aspens was the bottoms of the front fenders. 
right down here, they had a tendency to trap water. And in 77, 78, they came up with a drain. But again, down here, sometimes within a year or two, this would start to rust away on this brand new Valario Nasbitt in 76. It led to recalls. And I've heard that many Chrysler dealers would have a supply of front fenders uh, in stock so the body shop could quickly respray and repair and, and fix the car under warranty because of the premature rust. That was one of the things about these cars. Uh, they were well engineered, but the execution was just mass production at its worst, really, in a way. Quality control wasn't great and rust was a big problem. Otherwise, these are great cars if you can find one from Arizona or someplace where there's no rust at all, because rust digs in these things. Uh, the good news is the rust doesn't take care of the wood on the sides, which of course is not really wood. But that's the story of the Super 6 and how manufacturer license plates sometimes led to boo-boos in publish. Now, of course, Motor Trend knew that was a mule, a pre-production prototype, but whenever you see a magazine article and you see a manufacturer's plate on the car, you can assume something about that car is weird. So read the story with a grain of salt. It's probably a UFO, um, a manufacturer car that may not be 100% production. Anyway, that's the story of Slant 6s. If you like this video, be sure to share it with your friends. Give us a thumbs up. And by all means, hit the bell so you know when the next Junkyard Crawl video hits, which is tomorrow morning.